Everyone's talking about the time skip, and I'm just here thinking about Nemesis and Seiro's fucking. Hey guys, PK here, and the E3 Nintendo Direct gave us a Three Houses trailer, as expected. There's a lot of story stuff to cover with this, so let's jump right in. The biggest thing revealed is the five year time skip that takes place. I guess there was some legitimacy to that leak that bomb dropped. My desire to look at the leak has lessened even more now. I didn't even think that was possible. Anyway, from the looks of things, our main trio became the rulers of each of their respective nations. Edelgard's outfit looks similar to Seiros' and Rhea's outfits, and her diadem has horns similar to the white dragon's horns from the crest mural. Dimitri is pissed and lost an eye, and Claude is looking even more attracted with that beard hot damn son. Oh, also? The main trio's nations are at war. Yeah, these best friends, now they're worst enemies and now I'm sad. What Edelgard and Dimitri say during the trailer definitely hint at a possible source of conflict between at least the Adrestian Empire and the Kingdom of Fargus. With a lot of possible conflicts happening at the Empire Kingdom border, it was only a matter of time until those two would end up at war. Edelgard's strong ties with the Church of Seros through her crest might be a driving force behind her reasons for waging war on Fargus. However, with her being against the idea of the Crests way back in last year's E3 trailer, something must have changed about her ideals before the time skip. In terms of Dimitri's reasons for war, the Joshua Lewin theory I had way back is pretty much confirmed at this point. He's unhappy with the treatment of the common people from the Elite. In the middle of the trailer, he's shown with blood splattered on his face, and this is pure speculation, he may have killed a noble out of resentment. The guy's been through some tough stuff to the point where he wants to basically kill everyone post time skip. The destruction of Garrick Mock Monastery and the possible massacre of his peers may have also been a reason, but we'll touch upon that later. Meanwhile, Claude and the Lester Alliance seem to be neutral in the conflict, and possibly hoping to bring peace to the other two nations again, as hinted by his lines in the recent E3 trailer. Speaking of them being at war, back in the direct trailer in February, our main trio is shown commanding the respective armies forward, which may hint that this Foldland War may start even earlier depending on your choices. This is hinted at with the cutscene where Sothis is walking down the steps. This scene is played in both the direct trailer and the recent E3 trailer, which hint at a connection between both then and now. The scenes differ in that in the E3 trailer, Sothis says, Both sides of time are revealed to you. What shall you do? She may have been talking to Byleth at this point after revealing to them the possible outcomes of their actions, but it's also a bit of a fourth wall break for the viewer. We've seen possible outcomes from the trailers for both before the time skip and after. What will we do? Also, speaking of past trailers, Edelgard's The Crests Are to Blame speech seems to take place before the time skip, but possibly after the school arc. She's definitely against the power of the Crests at this point, but from her lines, Do you dare to walk this path with me? One misstep and we fall to our ruin. She sounds like she and Byleth are preparing for war together, and not just any war, a big one. Also, with a war going on, does that mean the teaching mechanic will be abandoned for a more traditional Fire Emblem experience after the time skip? Other than the three nations of Foldland, we've also got some evil dudes who probably have big roles in this big ol' war going on. Let's go over the villains we've got a good amount of info about first. Reaper Knight is confirmed to be a horse rider, so my theory of him being in the Yasha class is shot. Also, being in broad daylight makes him look silly. When the Japanese Twitter posted that one screenshot of him, he looked like a spooky scary skeleton. Here where it's all sunny and bright, he looks like a silly smiley skeleton. Moving on, we got a quick clip featuring something happening regarding Flame Emperor. His mask gets crushed underfoot by someone in armor. This probably happens after Flame Emperor is defeated, and the person crushing his mask is probably Catherine. The armored footwear definitely hints that a knight of Saros was responsible, and Geralt and Alois's legs are just too thick to be the slender leg we see, so Catherine's our best bet. I'll bet we'll be bringing her along when we face the Flame Emperor during a field study, because of course a field study involving that will happen. Anyway, onto the villains we saw in this year's E3 trailer. We have a really old black-eyed dude who had one line. So the fell star even consumes the darkness itself. Could this fell star be connected to Byleth in some way? The pattern on male Byleth's chest resembles a star, and his crest sort of resembles one too. On top of that, it's called the fell star, so... Is Big Daddy Grima coming back? Is Sothis Big Daddy Grima? Okay, wait, nope, 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 not going there, nope, nope, nope. Also, we got the other sorcerer dude who we saw in the direct trailer in the middle of a summoning circle of some sort. Quick thing to note, but it doesn't seem like he and Geralt are the same person. You wanna know what happens to Geralt? He's dead. Like, super fucking dead. He didn't even appear in this trailer, so it's safe to assume he isn't living through this time skip. 
Hell, he's probably dead after Garrick Mach gets destroyed, again touching upon that later. But anyway, back to Sorcerer Dude. The summoning circle he's inside of has 29 nodes. We know about the 21 crests of Voldlin and Byleth's crest for sure, making 22 confirmed ones. However, Petra is a noble from outside Voldlin, and she possibly has her own crest not featured in the church mural, so that would make 23. Sorcerer Dude could also have his own crest, which his earring is designed after, so that makes 24. That could mean there are five more unconfirmed crests. Speaking of Geralt, let's talk about one scene from the trailer. The one where there are two shadowed silhouettes, a man on the right lifting up a woman on the left. It's pretty unclear who these people are, but if the grail parallels I talked about in a previous analysis video are correct, this scene may depict Geralt accidentally killing his wife due to some unfortunate circumstances. However, there is some evidence that may debunk this theory. In the trailer, Dimitri's line, someone must end this cycle of the strong trampling the weak, is played over this scene. On top of that, the man's silhouette more closely resembles the sorcerer dude's profile rather than Geralt's. If that man is Sorcerer Dude, could he have possibly been a noble of Fargus? Maybe Dimitri met him before? And maybe witnessed his cruelty towards commoners? Speaking of Sorcerer Dude, his summoning circle may have something to do with freeing Nemesis from the chained-up box he was locked in. There's a glowing red circle at the door, and Nemesis just shoots his hands out of the door like holy shit. Nemesis is a big boy, and he just rips the chain apart like it's nothing. Yeah, no one wants to mess with this guy. He was locked in that chamber good, no one wants him to get out. After his defeat in the War of Heroes, he was sealed in there, but why was he sealed and not straight up killed? Was he maybe saved by his followers and kept him alive just in time? And maybe he was sealed away so that he could be called upon again when Foldland needed him. Like in a time of turmoil, and the church is messing things up. Again. I don't know, just saying. Okay, let's take a bit of a breather and talk about that one scene where Dimitri and Edelgard are doing that ballroom dance. Alright, yeah. There we go. That's nice. Just think of the happy times before everything goes to absolute SHIT! But yeah, I think that this scene would take place towards the end of the school arc. I can imagine that some sort of big social gathering happens at the end of the school year. The kids going to prom and all that, asking each other to dance and have fun, you know, the good stuff. A nice, calm before the storm sort of deal. This particular scene may also play when Edelgard and Dimitri have their own respective ace supports with another student, but that's pure speculation. Alright, let's talk legendary weapons. Each lord is depicted with weapons similar to the Sword of Creation from their official art. By the way, that's the official name of the whippy, bony, spinal cordy blade. On top of that, each weapon has a crest stone resting in their cavities, meaning that each lord knows the power of their respective crest stones and can use them with their own legendary weapons. We do see Claude's arrow getting all glowy glowy as he's getting ready to fire it, after all. It is curious, however, how Edelgard's axe actually doesn't use the crest stone of Seros. It actually uses the stone of a so far unnamed crest. This most likely means that these weapons and crest stones can be used by anyone who has a crest themselves. It doesn't need to be in possession of someone who has that particular crest. In terms of the Sword of Creation, at the end of the recent E3 trailer, Byleth is shown to draw out the sword's power, but his hair turns a pale green in the process. His hair is pale after the time skip, indicating that this scene happens before the time skip. However, we did see Byleth possibly wielding a glowing Sword of Creation in a few screenshots in one of the Famitsu articles. So, this scene may be showing Byleth unlocking its full potential? It is curious that he could get the sword all glowy glowy without a crest stone in this scene. The sword is shown to have a crest stone in a pre-time skip scene, but is definitely not there in post-time skip. Maybe Byleth learned how to activate the sword's full power without one? Also, speaking of Byleth's hair color, far-fetched theory incoming, but this weird theory has been racking my brain for a while. Just follow me on this for a bit. Seros is depicted lovingly caressing the Sword of Creation, which we've already established belonged to Nemesis originally. Why would she do that with a weapon of her enemy? It wouldn't make sense if Nemesis was against her. So... what if he wasn't? What if they were friends? Maybe even... lovers? And they had a baby? And that baby had a baby? And that baby had a baby? And the generations kept going and going until BAM we get Byleth? His hair gets to be a pale green color after that one scene, and Seros got that blondish, greenish hair going, and Nemesis got that white hair going. Okay, okay, I know that Byleth's paling hair color wasn't genetic at all, and Nemesis's white hair probably just means he's old, but still, I do think it's weird that Seros would caress the weapon that belonged to the leader of the nation she was at war with. Also, speaking of weapons, in that one scene where Nemesis and Seros clash swords, we see Seros wielding the curvy, wavy, pointy blade, and Nemesis wielding the Sword of Creation, which confirms that the curvy blade originally belonged to Seros. The curvy blade is wielded by Edelgard in the time skip, so it's possible that Catherine passed on the sword to Edelgard, since, as we know, Catherine was in possession of the curvy sword at some point. 
Speaking of the Curvy Sword, let's talk about the Crest of Seiros. It's seen on the hilt of the Curvy Sword and on Seiros' shield, which confirms that the War of Heroes takes place after Seiros gets blessed by the goddess. It's also seen on the forehead of the White Dragon, which is also the same dragon from the Church Mural. Does this mean the White Dragon is connected to the goddess? Could the dragon be the goddess herself? Probably not. The biggest hint that this proves the dragon is the goddess is one line from last year's E3 trailer. Now the goddess watches over Foldlin from her kingdom above. The dragon was sleeping underneath Foldlin, so that definitely means the dragon is not the goddess. However, this does give a hint as to who the goddess could actually be. Sothis. She's usually depicted descending down steps or looking down upon Byleth when they're in their mind space. And in the newest Fire Emblem Cypher card, Sothis's crest appears on the newest cards and is called the Crest of the Goddess. Some may argue that the Cypher card game shouldn't be considered canon information, but calling the crest this name is very appealing. Speaking of Sothis, we do see a clip of her dragon form possibly awakening. No indication as to why, though. Other people who this eye could belong to are Rhea and Seiros. This eye seems to be too round to be their eyes, though. However, one could argue that the hair doesn't match Sothis's, but the wind whipping it around, it's hard to say. Alright, so a time skip happened. But what exactly happened? So, here's the thing. Looks like we've got more FE parallels because fire. Fire raining down everywhere. God damn it, Arvis. It could be theorized that the Adrestian Empire could be the cause of all this fire raining down. I mean, they are good at magic, but I'm not exactly convinced. But that's just my opinion. But anyway, Garrick Mock Monastery gets destroyed and probably a bunch of students get caught in the crossfire. Our main trio react to the devastation in their own ways and oops, it's more bloodshed and war between the nations begin. And with all the fire and flames, the white dragon rises from the ground awakened from its slumber. So yeah, Foldman's gone to shit. However, hope is not lost. You will regain the trust and companionship of the main trio and work together to bring peace to the continent again. The students you taught five years ago will rejoin you. Those thoughts who have been dead will come back and help you fight against the true evil in the land. Peace will reign in Foldlin again, only if you make the right choices. Of course, most of that is pure speculation, but you gotta admit, that sounds kick-ass. Alright guys, thank you all so much for watching. I'm pretty hyped for Three Houses. The story looks like it could be pretty amazing. Although a lot of people said that about Fates, but yeah, and we all know how that happened. Um... But you know what? I have high hopes. Everything looks great, even the gameplay. Speaking of the gameplay, we'll be talking about that in a future video. I'm going to be working real hard on that once this video is up. But anyway, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye!